So Paul then writes this letter to Titus, who he, he already has known and established his ministry, and basically has planted him for the season on the island of Crete, and he tells us why he did it. Verse 5 in the middle, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So he's been appointed by the Apostle Paul as his delegate in that area, and that's clear. He's not a pastor. He sets up elders. That's his job. So let's go over this then. Uh, would you hold a finger here? Meet me back in Ephesians, in Ephesians in chapter 1. Let's look at a very important little piece of Scripture, Ephesians 1. I brought my slow-turning Bible tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, look with me, verse number 19. He says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners... But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So at the time that Titus gets written under inspiration from God to be put into the canon of Scripture later as inspired material, Paul is an apostle of God. And we know that the clock is ticking on Paul. His days are numbered and his life's going to end. He's going to have his head cut off by the Roman government. But he is an apostle until his death. But the apostles are going away at the time that Paul writes that letter to Titus that we're holding in our laps tonight. Because the apostles are going away. We're Freddie, wait a minute. I heard an apostle on the TV just yesterday. Well, look with me here, what we just read, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Therefore, you're no more strangers, strangers and foreigners. I'm so excited. I'm reading ahead of myself. Slow down, Freddie. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built, that is you, you believers now, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. So Jesus is giving us an example here of how the Lord builds his church. And it started in the foundation, amen? You don't, you don't start a building on, on the roof. It starts with a foundation. Before it can go up, it's got to go down. You've got to dig down. And it's clear in the Bible here and other places too that that foundation is built out of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and the apostles and prophets. Okay, Paul said, for there is no other foundation that any man could lay but the foundation of Jesus Christ. So he's the cornerstone. Now that cornerstone's the first piece in the building. It's the most important piece of the building. You don't put the cornerstone down, you can't have a building. If you put a bad cornerstone down, you might get a building, but it'll be a crooked building because that cornerstone not only is the strength of the building, it's also the orientation of the building. It has to be square and true. And that's what Jesus is in the church of God. Amen. He's the cornerstone and he is the head of the church. But notice what else is in the foundation in Ephesians chapter 2, apostles and prophets. So when you're building a building, how many foundations does it have? One. Does every floor in a building have a foundation? No. You could have many floors. You could have many, as we say, stories in a building. But the Empire State Building, long in my childhood, known by us as the tallest building in the world, and I remember always being afraid of walking under that building. Because my brother told me that if you flipped a penny off that building, it hit you in the head, it'd kill you. It's so tall. 
Yeah, be careful now when you got older brothers and you walk around tall buildings. <laughs> but there's only one foundation in the tallest building in the world, amen? And there's only going to be one foundation in the building of the church of God. And that foundation's established. It's Jesus, the cornerstone, and the apostles and the prophets. So when Paul the apostle and the other apostles died... There were not apostles. In fact, Paul called himself as one born, what, out of time. But that's not happening today. Now, you could claim to be one of those, and some have. Some are now. In fact, there's a sort of a new organization of people calling themselves apostles. You could just about take any title, any self-anointed title that you want to, but that doesn't mean that you're actually that thing. Amen? There are not going to be apostles. So the, the church is based on order, order. The order is that Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church, and he's also the head. He's pretty much throughout, amen? He's the foundation that we walk on and build on, and he is the undisputed head of the church. Hmm? And there is no other. A government cannot be the head of a church because there's already a head, and there won't be two heads. There'll be one, and that's Jesus Christ. But in that foundation are the apostles and prophets. So when the apostles are gone, there are not going to be any others added in. Where would they go? You can't liquefy the foundation again. They're going to go into the side walls of the building. They'll go in the I, I like to think that God right now is putting the tin roof on our building. Amen. That means the rapture is about to happen. We don't know where the Lord is in the building, but we know this. They're not going to be apostles. So the order of the church as it's established is Jesus is the cornerstone. The apostles and the prophets are in the foundation there. Therefore, we can build on top of that. But if the apostles are going away, then who's going to speak for God? Well, the Lord's been busy. He's been at work. The Lord is giving them the scriptures. And Paul, in front of our eyes, writes for us this book that we'll call Titus. Amen. And the scriptures then are being completed by those whom God has chosen and equipped to write for him. So that now we, we won't need apostles who are speaking forth from themselves right out of their, their living spirit through their mouths, the word of God. We won't, we won't have that, the Lord wants us to know. We don't have to look for a famous individual who will come among us and just Ugh, and speaks out the word of God. Rather, where we're headed and where we now know we've come is that God has given a whole bunch of people his written word. So that when we hear anyone speak now and claim to be a speaker for God, we can hold the word of God in our lap and make sure what the speaker says is either right or wrong. Amen? So we have elders that are coming on the scene now. This is not a new thing. It's an old thing, more about that at a different time. I don't want to get um, distracted by this and say too much about this, but I want to put this letter from Paul to Titus in its right perspective. Titus's job is to establish the elders in the church on that island of Crete. That is what he's doing in this place. So when you get to chapter 2 then... Paul is giving Titus what his work will be like as he establishes the order, Christ the head, elders with an apostle nowhere, are you listening? To that? With an apostle nowhere to be found, only a letter from Paul who was one. So be careful today if you have uh, someone speaking as an apostle, you know, they're requirements and qualifications for that and there's not a man alive today who can own up to that so be careful what we do have are elders who are men leading churches this is God's order elders lead churches elders who are carrying Bibles speaking forth the truth from God not out of their own soul nor out of their dreams 
But elders who speak the word of God from the word of God are the leadership of churches today. And people are able to hold a Bible. So rather than have, and I don't say this disrespectfully at all, but rather than have a few hot shots who are sprinkled around, who just show up and just speak God's word, which was the way at the time. What we have today are elders leading churches full of people holding the written word of God in their laps. Which way do you like the best? It sounds like the latter to me because now we, are, we can be in the loop with God rather than, as John said to us, try the spirits. Now, we're under that command still. We should try everything, but we don't, we don't have to, to become private investigators to see if this word is true or not. We just hold the Bible in our lap and read along. Amen? So... Titus's job then is to is for order. So he is into order. I want you to see what his word is here. Chapter 2 now. With that foundation, let's go. Verse 1, chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You could underline that. That's the phrase. That's what Paul tells Timothy we're after here. This is what must be established. Sound doctrine. Look across the page. If you have a Bible like mine, over to verse 15. Here it is again. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So you get the word speak in verse 15. You get the word speak in verse number 1 of chapter 2. And we're going to connect those two words with the material between them written by Paul to his delegate Titus. Sound doctrine. That's what must be established. One of my children was talking to me the other day, and I don't remember what the question was, but I'm so thankful that in, in my life, there are people around who are asking great questions that give us an opportunity to go into the Bible together. But at the end of my answer, I can remember telling my child, I think I'll write an article. I put it off for several years now. I, I don't really want to write it. It can sound a little negative, and we all like smiley things, right? But the title of the article probably will be, Doctrine is Dead. There are two kinds of churches across America today. And you might call them different things, but I'm going to call them these names. Number one is the attractional model, the attractional model. Here's what it says. We're going to turn this stage into a happening center for entertainment. We're going to get the right lights, the right colors, the right sounds. We are going to attract people by giving them a stage of entertainment. And the attractional model in the year 2021, I will tell you, absolutely works. If our goal is to get a lot of people, you can get a lot of people by attracting them. Uh, Disney World can, get, can fill the park, charging people a lot of money to come in with a stage that glitters. Hmm? But ladies and gentlemen, we have no model for the attractional church in the Bible. What we have are some... People like Paul who write letters to people like Titus who say, teach sound doctrine and provide order in the churches. So I guess I just gave away my position on this. I am not a fan of the attractional model where we basically entertain people by turning the stage into a production, a performance. We need to provide good things from what you may call a stage, but that's not at all the idea of Scripture. The other model we call the edificational model. That is that we invite people to come and we edify them. That means we build them up. They come to be built up by the teaching of the Scriptures. That they, if they are unsaved, they get the gospel from Scripture. Nothing builds like the gospel. Amen. But as 
as newborn babes then who desire the sincere milk of the word, we have the word of God for them, not a show, not a show. And where the sound doctrine that comes from the teaching of the word of God is lost, there goes the order that's in the church and there goes the order that will be in people's lives. And this is what's at stake today across our country and across the world. Are the people who come to the churches receiving edificational truth that is sound doctrine? Let me explain this. Even the word doctrine is is frowned on today as though it's a bad thing. That It's a dark or heavy thing. Well, doctrine is just truth about God. Doctrine is truth about God. And our source for the truth about God has to come from the Bible, not our imaginations. Amen? It doesn't come, listen, it doesn't come from songs. It comes from the Word of God. Now, hopefully we have songs that are written out of the, the fountainhead of the truth that someone got from the Word of God. Hopefully our songs are built as extensions of the Word, but our songs are not inspired that the level of scripture is. Hmm? But we don't get these things out of our feelings. That the truth from God doesn't necessarily come from stories that we tell, though no one loves a great story more than I do. A great story in its place is a wonderful thing. But if we are just storytellers, look, they can get that at the Civic Center. If all we can do is provide entertainment, they can buy a ticket somewhere in town and get that. If all we have are events and parties, then everybody join the Y and get it over with. But church is for the establishment of sound doctrine. Now, that shouldn't be deep and heavy and, and laden with negativity. No, no, I think nothing is more light and fluffy, and strong, and beautiful than straight teaching about God. Amen? What is, who has on their stage anything better to learn of than the grace of God that saves? So here is Titus, an extension of the Apostle Paul, who's establishing the elder leadership of the church on the island of Crete. And so he says, uh, Titus, you speak the truth about doctrine. Verse 2. Now, he's going to break it down into these different age groups. Now, if you try very hard, you'll find your own group in this text. Not necessarily trying to get you to see that. I'm trying to get you to see the whole thing and how Paul breaks down the whole thing into these aged groups. Verse 2. That the aged men, there's the first group, aged men. These are old men. There's nothing disrespectful in that. Thank God we need old men. Amen. Amen. The aged men be sober. And here comes the description sober. What does that mean? Well, it means alert. It doesn't mean not drunk. Although if you're drunk, you're certainly not that. It's to be alert. And alcohol or some other foreign substances can go into an old man and make him not be alert. So Paul is giving Titus what a man looks like who has received sound doctrine, who has come from a place of edification, because entertainment really can't do this, can it? Please understand, I'm not down on entertainment. I love to laugh at a good joke. I love a good play, love wonderful songs if Jesus is in them. But these things can't do for the human soul what sound doctrine that comes from Bible teaching can do. And there's a result here, and this is what we're going for in the church. He said that there be aged men who have been under this kind of edificational ministry, and they've become sober. They are alert. They're not distracted. Alert. This means they keep their eye on the ball. They're not distracted. Satan is here. There's a fallen, broken world here, and every danging little fish lure is out there in the water. But this guy... He's grounded. He's sober. He's alert. Here's the second word, grave, grave. This is gravity. This is gravity. This man is not flighty. He is anchored 
by the gravity of the truth that he knows about God. This guy is not all over the map. He's consistently grounded in the truth, and it shows in his life. He's temperate. This man is strong against what he comes up against. He is sound in faith. Sound in faith. His faith is established. It didn't come from a dream he had. It didn't come from his life experiences. His faith came from what? Sound doctrine. He's received good truth from the word of God. And because of that, you could call this man sound in his faith. In charity. Charity is love in action. It's love in action. That's charity. And that's what this man brings to the table. Love in action. You, you want to be around that man? I'm seriously asking you, you don't want to be around that man? How many of you think we got too many of those men around? We need, we need to get rid of some of those old men. How many of you? That's, we need more of them. Amen. Let that tribe increase. Old men who have been under sound, they've been under an edificational ministry and it's turned them through the years of their lives into these kinds of men faithful men based in the truth of scripture anchored there unmovable fly the glitter of this world by their eyes try and distract them Mm, you won't distract him because of who he is and the character that he possesses because of sound doctrine is it possible that someone could be under sound doctrine and not be that of course absolutely those are the people who keep us awake at night Those are the people I think that Jesus would have looked at and said, if the things that were done in you had been done to Sodom and Gomorrah, they'd still be standing strong. In other words, they were not given near the things that you were given, and yet you're not different than they are. It's entirely possible that one could could miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime to become that in old age and squander it all by not receiving what was offered. Verse 3, here comes the second group, the aged women. Now, you're supposed to just keep your eyes on the page whenever you read verse 3 and not look around. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. There's the first word that describes a woman who has seized the opportunity in an edificational ministry and made the most of it. She's a holy woman. Do you understand, doesn't it dawn on you, doesn't it ring in your mind that even in reading the description of these, that these words like grave in verse 2 and holy in verse 3 are words that sound kind of square in the reigning culture? Does it sound a little boring to you? The man is grave. The woman is holy. Does that seem uncool to you? I I think there's nothing cooler than a man who has gravity, that a man is anchored and not distracted in life, that he doesn't waste his years chasing things that are not stable and the gifts of God. I think it's an awesome thing when a woman is holy. She's not flighty. She's not a two-faced woman. She's not a woman of the world. She values the love that will come out of her heart more than the makeup she puts on her face. She's a holy woman. She's tried and true. From the inside, she's a beauty. Holy's not a dull thing. Holy's not square. To be grave does not make a man not cool. Or if it does, if that's what cool is, I don't want to be cool. Count me for something else besides cool. If that's how cool must be defined. I think this is cool. She's holy in a world that's lost its mind. Hmm? Not false accusers. She has better things to do than to falsely accuse. This means that she accuses. She places a wrong on someone But it's not a fit. So she's using her mouth 
and attaching wrong to someone that didn't do the wrong. This woman has far better things to do than that. She's been shaped by edification in her life. She's a holy woman. She's not a false accuser. She's not given to much wine. Now here's the picture. Here's the, the picture of a worldly woman. She, she's not holy. She is a false accuser. She's spending her time trying to knock down other women so that she somehow herself will rise up in the opinions of others. And she is, she is dousing it all with alcohol. Smoothing the rough edges, smoothing the bitterness inside with, with the lubrication of alcohol. And she's not teaching any good thing with her life. She would only likely serve as a bad example to the other younger women by her life, but not this woman. She's a teacher of good things. How, how could she be a teacher of good things? Because she has, buddy, she's learned good things. She has been under the edificational model of a ministry somewhere, and she soaked it up like a sponge, and she is, listen to me, she's the personification of the edification of the Word of God that she's received. And now the things that she's learned are coming right from her mouth and from her hands. She is teaching good things. Verse 4. And the next category, it's young women. That they, that is the aged women in verse 3, that they may teach the young women. And so in verse 3, the aged women, their teaching ministry doesn't come from being pastors. There are none of them that will be appointed by Titus. There won't be an older woman who will be an elder in the church. Well, yeah, but it says they're good teachers. But they're not good teachers in the church to men. They're good teachers of the younger women. And how many of you think we have too much of that in the world today? Too many of our older women who are teaching those good things they've learned to our younger women. So one day there'll be older women who can carry on the teaching they receive from godly older women. How many of you think the world is just too overrun with those aged women teaching good things to the... It's more likely that we'd ask the question, what young woman in your life has an aged woman teaching her steadfastly, steadfastly teaching her good things that she'll need to know to be a godly, holy woman? Who? Titus chapter 2, in my view, is the great failing of the church of God in the world today. It's a failing and a falling down of carrying the truth of God from sound doctrine that comes from an ordered edificational church that carries from the aged men to the aged women to the younger women and the younger men that families can be established in the truth of sound doctrine I think it's the great failing today a practical question would be if you're a young woman who's your older woman who's teaching you those good things as a woman that can come woman to woman if you're an aged man, let me ask you, who's your, who's your man? Are you living the kind of life that it would take? Are you grave? Are you grounded? Are you living in the base of truth? Or have you squandered the opportunity that you couldn't teach a young man to be pure and strong because you're not that man yourself? In order for this model to take root, it, it has to be determined in the faithfulness of those who receive first the sound doctrine that, that molds them into this model that Paul is telling Titus, Titus, this is what we're going for, this. And it'll be generational truth after generational truth, and we'll be strong all the way to the day of the rapture. Amen? But if there's a breakdown... There's a breakdown. Verse 4 then, that they may teach the young women. What are they teaching to be sober? What is that? Alert. That they're alert, that they can keep their eye on the ball. How many of you think that our young women are living in a godly world and the only things their eyes can look on are godly things that'll edify? 
That's not at all the world we're living in, is it? But the older women are to come along, get a, get a younger woman under their arm, in, in their grasp, and teach them how to be sober, how to keep their eye on the ball, how to be alert in life and not make the mistakes that people make who are going down the drain, who are losing the farm, to love their husbands. Do you know an older woman today who's teaching a younger woman how to love her husband? You know what's more likely, in my view, is hearing stories of a woman who says, yeah, my husband, he's, he's a failure, but I'm staying with him. I've stayed with him. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't, we don't have the command that the love of God in marriage is staying with them. The call that we get from God is not just to stay with him. It's to honor him. The call is not to stay with the woman that's not satisfying. It's to love her literally to your death. Are you listening to me tonight? The call from God is that the husband who has a wife who is not living to the standard is not to stay with her. The call is to love her to the death of the man. So we need people who have lived this, done there, uh, been there, who've done this, and can now transfer this. That's, that's the model here. So the young women are, are receiving this teaching that causes them to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be, it goes on, verse 5, to be discreet. What does this mean? Well, discreet means without loudness. It's without loudness. And when you read these uh, descriptive terms of our young women, ask yourself, is this what our young women are receiving in the world, that they're supposed to be like this? Who are the most famous women in America right now? Loud women. <laughs> Loud women. Hmm? So that if you're a young girl and you're growing up and you long for attention, if you, you long to be adored, accepted, you might get the idea that what you're supposed to do is some kind of wild things. They'll get everybody's attention. They'll get you some hits. They get you some hits, all right. But it might not be what you're really longing for to get those kinds of hits. Because the call here is to be discreet. It's without loudness. It's chaste. What does that mean? It means sexually pure. It's sexually pure. Yeah, Freddie, I'm, I'm going to be a virgin when I marry. That, that is not necessarily sexually pure. Do you understand? To be a virgin does not mean that a person is chaste. The mind is the most powerful organ romantically. If the mind is not pure, then this is not chaste. Chaste is to be sexually pure, not simply that everybody's clothes didn't get taken off. It's chaste, and we have younger women who are receiving this instruction from older women. He says, keepers at home. Is that the model that our younger women are receiving, to be keepers at home? Or is it to become a YouTube star or some other form of expression? Not that anything is wrong with being on YouTube. But what is... What is the message that we think is worthy of a spot on YouTube? Is it how wild I can be? Is it how much flesh I can show? Is it how lewd and uncouth I can make my life? Is it that I give a parade of the flesh that feeds men's eyes? Is that what will make a successful young woman? Are they receiving the idea that for me, the greatest thing I can make in my home, in the husband that I'm longing to have one day, the greatest thing that I can do is be a keeper at home and buddy raise my children that when grandma's long dead and gone, they'll still be remembering grandma brought it to me. Is that the model that our young women are, are growing in today or is it something else? 
This is not at all to pick on anybody to say that women should not work. Please don't put words into my mouth. But the call here is that they're keepers, that they are known as keepers at home. If you can be a keeper at home and do some other things on the side, you go for it and God bless you. But the call for these women as they're learning from older women is to be chaste and to be keepers at home. That home is kept by mama. Hey, that home is kept by mama. Mama's keeping the home. If the children can't say that, mama was about something else, something else that in her life was brought to priority. I've got to go and do and become keeper at home. Mama kept my home. And I want to look at you. Mama kept my home, and I'm held together today by the strings of love that my mama put in my life. I'm here because of mama today. To be discreet, chaste, verse 5, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, Oh, yeah, that's what every teenage girl is hearing, right? You'll be obedient to your husband. I tell girls, look, no one's going to force you to get married. And if being obedient to your own husband scares you to death, well, don't get one. Nobody's, nobody's making you marry one, but this ought, to, this ought to give you some guardrails about what kind of man one day you're going to say, I will, towards it's got to be some guy that you are willing to get in the, you get in the trace with him. You yoke up with him, and he's going to be the lead ox in the yoke. So you better choose wisely because this is the model that we have from the Bible. Now, I want you to look at this. The reason, the reason for all this at the end of verse 5 is so good. He says that the word of God be not blasphemed, that the word of God be not blasphemed. If we, don't, if we don't establish this edificational model of the word, this is what's at stake, church, that the word of God could be blasphemed in our time. Because after all, here's the idea. If we go out and we have our aged men or like all the aged men in the world, if our aged women look just like all the women in the world, sound like them, act like them, do the things all the aged women in the world are doing, if our young women don't have the models, if our young men are missing the heroes of the faith in their own lives, if we have modeled ourselves after the attractional model of the world, guess what we'll offer? The same things that are offered in the world. And therefore, God would be blasphemed as God is spoken incorrectly of unless we bring this kind of model into the world. So that's what's at stake, Paul says to Titus. If, if we don't establish this through sound doctrine, then the word of God can be blasphemed. And you know that that is actually happening in the world today. When the church is not what church is supposed to be, the word ends up being criticized. And if the word is criticized, then God's never honored. Well, I want to to tell you that outside of the grace of God and good sound doctrine, this is absolutely out of reach for us. I want you also to understand that in many places today, a passage of scripture like this one would be taught that says, so if you want to be saved, you got to be like that. And that is not at all. This is so far away from the truth of scripture. And this is not at all the message of Paul to Titus. He's not, he's not telling Titus, tell them to be all these things, to get all this arranged orderly in their lives so that they'll be saved. No, no, we're saved on day one. <laughs> day one is when we are saved, not by obeying, not by doing, not by being sober, sound, grave, holy, or any. No, no. We're trying to fashion ourselves so that we'll be accepted by God. Here's the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ came down because we couldn't be these things in ourselves. And he came down to pay our fine for our rotten sin. It's called salvation by grace, 
we get something that we don't deserve and it's the best news in the whole wide world for a sinner like me. Jesus Christ paid all our sin on the cross. He rose from the dead to prove to us that our fine was paid and he offered everlasting life for free. Is that good? It comes to anybody who believes in him and it's absolutely free. It's the gift of God. It's already completely paid and it gives everlasting life that could never be lost. Let that represent you and me. Let that represent our sin. We don't fit that model naturally at all. This model only comes through salvation by faith and sitting under edificational ministry and sound doctrine over time and obeying the word that's received. But naturally, this is who we are and we have sin on us. Let that be God. God is holy. He has no sin at all. Our sin is a barrier between us and him. We can't get to him because of our sin. No amount of trying to be these things could ever get us to God because we can't be these things alone, separated from God. That's religion and it's broken. It doesn't work. But this is the way to have life is to realize that God himself took on flesh Jesus came down to the world. He took our sin and bore it in his own body. There's the love of God. There's the grace of God. He didn't have any sin to pay for, but he took our sin and paid that by a death payment that pleased God infinitely. God called it the propitiation. It was paid by Jesus. It's a satisfactory payment, and then he rose from the dead. Look, our barrier's gone now. Our sin's all paid what used to separate has been moved away by Jesus Christ. We could have everlasting life with him. I'm talking about being joined with God forever by believing in him. It doesn't come by work. It doesn't come by obedience. It doesn't come by fulfilling a model. It's just by faith in Christ. That's day one of your knowing God. It comes by receiving a gift by faith.